Uh, before we begin, just a few words about the final assignment. Uh, as you have seen, it is completely open-ended. And what's most important is for you to understand the spirit of the assignment. The spirit is to serve as a provocation for you to engage the argument of the course and use your engagement as a, uh, a reason or a pretext to develop your voice and your position in programmatic thought, in the imagination of alternatives. So that's what I want you to do. It's, it's not clearly not a research paper, although you're free to research as much or as little as you like. Uh, I don't care about any particular style of citations. Uh, it's a thought paper. And you are free to consult with one another or with anyone else uh, in the course or not in the course to share your drafts, to discuss your ideas. The only restraint is that you be able to say, in the end, in good faith, that the final writing is largely an expression of your own mind. Uh, if I had a conception of what a good answer would look like, either in form or in substance, I would not have designed the assignment in this fashion. So I prefer to be surprised, both with respect to content and with respect to form. That's my minimalist elucidation of the assignment. Do you have any questions or remarks? So obviously, it follows from what I just said that I don't want you to ask me whether this or that is a good theme. Because if I were to guide you in this way, to veto, to direct, that would subvert the purpose of the exercise. Any questions or any remarks about the final assignment? Yeah. So today we have two subjects, and it may be that the second subject carries over into class next week. Uh, the first subject is education. And the second subject is globalization. So the programmatic alternative that I have been outlining and discussing with you in the course of the semester has what you could regard as four parts, some of them much more developed than others. So one part is the progressive project in political economy, the democratization of the market order. And there the themes have been the relation of the advanced part of production, the vanguard of production, as I have called it, to the rest of the economy, to the rear guard. The relation of finance to the real economy, and especially to the productive agenda of society, and the relation of labor to capital. And this is the most salient part, must be the most salient part, I believe, of any progressive position today and any society in the world. The fundamental problems of <clears throat> production and of labor will naturally occupy most of the time and attention of the progressive forces in the world. Uh, the second theme, the second axis of this alternative is the replacement of the flawed, weak democracies of today by high energy democracies, as I have described them. The deepening of democracy is the indispensable counterpart to the democratization of the market. And there's an intimate relation between these two projects. Uh, as I have argued in an earlier class, no society reforms its state, its politics, 
in order only later to decide what to do with the reform state and the reform politics. The incitement to this deepening of democracy must come largely from the reorientation in political economy. And it is uh, pushed by that, by that reorientation, that we would then deepen democracy. Of course, there are independent reasons why we, that we would have to deepen democracy. But as a matter of historical fact, of practical experience, it's only when we need to change the course of politics that we do change it. The third theme, much less developed than these two themes in the argument of the course, is the self-organization of civil society outside the market and outside the state, but also encouraged by the forces that lead to the democratization of the market and to the deepening of democracy. And the fourth theme is then the creation of the agent, the individual agent who can stand up and flourish in the midst of the vast range of changes that such a project implies. And this entire programmatic argument with these four axes that I have just recalled is, as I understand it, just the reverse side of an idea about the constituencies which such a project would help develop and on which it would rely. And that was the discussion that we had at several moments in the development of the argument about the contradiction that has to emerge in the elites, and then above all, the relation of that contradiction to the new mass base of support, which I called the subjective petty bourgeoisie. And the great task then of the progressives of approaching this mass of people who are poor, absolutely or relatively, uh, but who have a petty bourgeois horizon, that is, by default, they aspire to archaic, isolated, retrograde family business and to what have been largely in the world its spiritual accompaniments consumerism, materialism, individualism, and you might say familism, the cult of the family. The task of the progressives then on this view is to provide this majority of humanity with alternatives to those diminished economic and spiritual forms. And it is then the combination of the agenda of institutional change with the construction of these alliances or coalitions, which represents the heart of the progressive project as I have described it here. Now then we come to the fourth axis today, the <coughs> axis of education, the treatment of which will also be relatively brief compared to the other, to compared to the discussion of the other axes. And education as just a fragment or a species of what I have called the haven. There's this whole argument about a progressive alternative uh, invokes a higher plasticity of social life, a storm of novelty, of creation, of innovation. And it requires then an agent, the individual, who is able to stand up and act and engage with the context, thrive, flourish, and prosper in the midst of these changes all around him. But education has a hybrid nature. It is part of this haven of vital safeguards against public and private oppression and of capability ensuring endowments. 
but it is also part of the storm. Uh, it's related to this idea that it's not enough to change institutions. We must also change consciousness. And every formidable change of any kind in the world must be simultaneously, as Tocqueville suggested, both political and religious. By political meaning institutional, and by religious meaning having to do with consciousness. Now, under democracy, affirming now what you might call a maximalist idea, a very high ambition, the school must be the voice of the future. It must directly exemplify this aspiration to transcend the present context. And it is by virtue of this impulse toward transcendence that the school most directly serves then the ideal of the enhancement of agency, which is in many ways the most powerful, the most appealing ideal in the world today. That the individual, rather than being just a beneficiary who is co-opted, becomes an agent who is empowered uh, and who manifests this empowerment in both the economic and the political life of society, and indeed in civil society outside both politics and the economy. But how can the school be the voice of the future? Because all we have by definition is the present and the, and the present visible tangible forces of civil society. What are those forces that influence the school and the program of education? In the first place, the family. And the family says to the child, become like me. So it was part of Plato's program, you will remember, to kidnap the child from the family, to rescue the family. It was a drastic solution which we can't accept uh, because the nurturing, the, subs the sustenance, the love that the child receives in the family is part of the creation of this empowered self. So the family is indispensable in, in some way, in some form, but at the same time, the influence of the family, and in particular its very common worldliness, must be resisted. The second great influence on the school is the state. The state says to the child, serve me. So all the programs of education, of public education in the world, have intended to create a citizen who is useful to the state in its present projects. And, of course, the state is oriented to the present, the state as it exists now, not the state as it would emerge from this energizing of democratic politics, which I proposed in earlier parts of the argument. And this intention of the state to shape the direction of education is expressed through the national curriculums that exist in the world. Now, finally, the third influence on education, representing the force of the present, the armies of the present, is the university and the university culture. Because behind these national curriculums, stand the orthodoxies of the university culture. In the university culture, there's the idea of a forced marriage between methods and subject matters. So there's an approved method by which to study every subject matter. So fundamental physics is studied by a structural anti-historical method. But evolutionary biology 
and the sciences of life by a historical method. Uh, economics, as I've said before, is not the study of the economy. It's the study of a method developed at the end of the 19th century by the marginalist theoreticians. The study of the economy by some other method, for example, Max Weber's writings on the economy, are not regarded as economics. And the application of this method to subjects that on their face seem to have nothing to do with the economy is regarded as economics because the primacy is the method. So that's the university, that's one of the themes of the university culture, these coerced marriages of subject matter and method. Another feature is the hidden philosophical presuppositions of the different disciplines. It's very clear, for example, in the gold standard of science and natural science, which is fundamental physics, particle physics, that it rests on metaphysical assumptions, which it doesn't avow or regard as contentious. And that it's the hard residue of its empirical findings could be interpreted in different ways if the metaphysical presuppositions were different. So for example, in the dominant tendencies of physics, in relativity, for example, the conception of a four-dimensional Riemannian manifold, a space-time manifold, is a metaphysical presupposition. And the empirical findings that, are, that this physics uh, invokes to support what it says uh, have to be combined with these metaphysical presuppositions for it to deliver the message. So this is the university culture. So the university culture is the high form of culture, but it's also in many respects as it exists in the world, a mystification. What then do the national curriculums that exist in the world do? The national curriculums, and the United States is one of the few countries in the world that doesn't have one. The so-called Common Core is not really a national curriculum. It's about testing. Uh, so what the national curriculums that exist in the world do is they infantilize these orthodoxies of the university culture. They're an infantilization of these orthodoxies. And they then induce the young to mistake the dominant ideas to the way things are. Uh, and of course, what we should desire is very early on to immunize the young against this, these presuppositions so that they're not condemned later to a life of intellectual servility, to immunize themselves so that they will arrive at the higher stages of education already with some defense, uh, the immunity against the orthodoxies of the university culture. Now, so these are the tangible worldly influences upon the school, but I just stated the belief that the school should be the voice of the future more than the voice of the present. And that it should contribute to capability in the present only by connecting capability in the present with the ability to go beyond the present to transcend. Now, of course, the future has no armies. So how is the future to be represented in the present? How are we to jump over the present circumstance and think of the school as the vehicle of something that doesn't exist? And that is a problem which is in some sense insoluble. So the only sense practically in which we can solve this problem is by taking these influences and balancing them against one another. And then by this contradiction that we arouse among them, 
to create a space in which we're able to do something and imagine ourselves as going beyond the present set of beliefs. But now I say, we, who is the we? Because the we then are the people involved in education, especially, and those who sympathize them with them. So it is a remarkable fact that in modern history, projects of education have often been formulated as national projects of emancipation. And they've had a national dimension, and they've been regarded as agendas of liberation in the nation. And that was true, for example, of Sarmiento in Argentina in the 19th century, of Vasconcelos in Mexico in the 20th century, and to some extent also of John Dewey in the 20th century in the United States, although Dewey himself did not hold public office. So this is the conundrum then that we have about the school, the school being both part of the haven and part of the storm, being the voice of the future, when the future can have no armies or no instruments in the present world. Now, let me stop right there before I go on and ask whether anyone has a remark or a question about the statement of this many-sided ambition regarding education. So now, let's focus first, yes. Yes. First, you in the back there. Oh. Yes, and then I'll come to you in the front. Yeah, I was yes. just curious, in addition to the family, oh. No, you, you. Okay. I'm sorry, you're lined up in a line, so <laughs> when I point to you, it could be one or the other, okay. <laughs> Next, you. Okay. Yeah. okay, I was curious, I didn't hear, as part of an influence on education, I didn't hear finance or the financial sector, and I wondered if that- You mean the funding of the schools? I'm gonna to yeah. come to the, that's the and next also subject. also this kind of, what you see in the US where there's been this resurgence of private education, and where does that fall into the domain of education? Well, because I'll, I'll, I'll come to that next, uh, uh, and the issue of the practical basis on which this educational program rests. Now, yes, you. So, Professor, I'm curious to know, uh, in this project and the framework that you just gave in the form of themes and uh, major points, uh, where does the, uh, the content uh, of such uh, education- resume, The content. The content, in the, in the sense that it would mean that it is not only to amplify which has been accumulated and learned, but also which, at the same time, sets to interrogate and argument and uh, question what has been learned, uh, and then at the same time be able to innovate depending on your circumstances and yes. experiences. Yes. Well, it obviously can't. So I'm going to come to that when I state my ideas about the content okay. of the pedagogic model. But uh, there's obviously a problem in this sense that the school cannot teach the physics of the future or the biology of the future or the social theory of the future because if we knew what that was, we would already be doing it, right? So what it has to focus is on the development of a, of a set of capabilities that are related to the imagination. And the question that will be central to the method of teaching and learning, to the pedagogic paradigm required by such a, a project is how we are to give practical form to that. And I, I will come to that, yes. Um, you were mentioning Plato and kind of removal of-, of The removal of the child from the family. Sure. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts were um, 
with the kibbutz model that um, was practiced in Israel, where uh, children would spend sort of most of their time um, under sort of a communal kind of education system away from their parents um, as kind of, you know, a hybrid between... Um, well, a way and not a way, right? Because typically the, the, the parents would still live in the community, yes. but there would be some relative dilution, some effacement of the strong boundary separating being in the family from being outside of it. So I don't think that's really an example of Plato's extreme idea of kidnapping the child, of removing it from the, from the influence of the family. Uh, and so we have to ask why, why is the family so important? Fundamentally, and we go back to the idea of the moral structure of what I call the haven. So that I mentioned, the parent says to the child, I love you. You have an unconditional place in the world, in my love. Now go out and raise a storm in the world. So the moral logic of this combination of the haven and the storm lies precisely in that. And the family is not a superfluous example of that. The family is the initial main basis of that. So that's what one would say defending this idea of the prejudicial character of this experiment that Plato, Plato proposed. Do you want to comment on that? No, no, thank you. That's what I was, uh -huh. that's what I was asking. Uh -huh. So uh, it's, it, it suggests that in the formation of the, of the strong identity of the self, there has to be a moment or an aspect in which the self feels that it uh, lies in the embrace of someone else, its parents, it's recognized, it's accepted, not for anything that it does or achieves, but just for being who it is. Uh, now, the believer might say that's the relationship we might have with God, uh, if the faith is strong enough. But we require some, some earthly expression of that idea. Uh, and that comes from the love of the parents. The love of the parents is then, for the believer, uh, a derivative expression of the love of God for the individual human creature. But in any case, it doesn't have any instrumental character, and it's unconditional. And its unconditional character is what, in this view, is indispensable to the empowerment of the self. So now, then the, the, the practical economic and institutional basis of education in a, in a democracy, taking as the context countries that are large, very unequal, and federal in structure, like the United States or like my country, Brazil. So, Three things are necessary. One is that there be a close examination, a monitoring of the results of performance, school by school and child by child. So we know what works and what doesn't work and what produces what results. Uh, now, there's a problem of that, of course, because the international tests are commonly used in the world in a kind of race to the bottom educationally. So you take an example of a country that is very widely admired for its success, its educational success, a small country like Finland. Finland uh, invests massively in individualized teaching directed 
to the bottom quintile of each class. And then it combines this heavy investment in the backward, the relatively less successful part of each class with uh, the remuneration and the prestige that it accords to the teachers. Uh, so this then leads to a rise in the international test. When the international tests, of course, are no silver bullet, they're no miracle. They simply designate the now established conventional view of what is good and what is bad. And so this success of the Finns, we have to relativize. It's not success at the task that I'm next going to describe. It's success at this lesser task of achieving a higher level of proficiency verbal and numerical proficiency uh, in the exercise in, to prepare the students for the conventional disciplines as they now exist. The second instrument that is necessary is a mechanism to redistribute resources and even staff from richer places to poorer places. And the principle is very simple. The education of a young person should not depend on the happenstance of where it is born or to whom it is born. So from this standpoint, the dependence of school finance on municipal finance in the United States is completely unacceptable because it will simply reproduce on a larger scale the the spatial and social inequalities of the existing society. Now, third then, this is the third instrument, and the third instrument is of the three, the one of which there are fewest examples in the contemporary world. There must be a procedure for corrective intervention or turnaround when a local school system repeatedly and persistently falls beneath the minimal acceptable threshold of investment and quality. If there is no procedure for correction and turnaround, we will be unable to ensure the objective of making the quality of the education independent of the accidents of birth. And of course, the geographical form of this is secondary to the problems of a class society. I mean, no one is able to choose his parents. And so already the greatest influence in the, on the school is the differential transmission of educational and economic advantage through the family, which is the fundamental mechanism of class society. And to the extent possible, it has to be neutralized. And its neutralization might begin in a, the geographical form that I just described, because the other forms, the forms that have to do with class society, are much harder to reach and to compensate for. They require the democratization of the market order, the substance of progressive political economy. Uh, now, it's interesting to reflect on the experience of the United States. So there, were, there was a progressive educational ideologist in the United States, John Dewey the theorist of progressive education. And uh, American education has two tiers. There's the mass of public schools, which mediocre, poor, and represent a kind of educational Fordism to a large degree. They still train students in these rote school skills. They still have a largely encyclopedic orientation. Their concern is with discipline because the workers in the factories of industrial Fordism needed to be disciplined, 
but they actually needed very little by way of education. And then there's the top tier, which are the elite public schools, the specialized public schools or the schools in the richer municipalities, and of course the private schools. So with respect to the question you ask about private education, uh, there, there's a, there is a, a complicated argument, a contradiction, because on the one hand, uh, you could say that in any society in which the elites, the relative elites, can escape from public education and educate their children privately, the pressure to change the character of public education will be greatly diminished. And that would be the reason to close this escape valve. But on the other hand, the suppression of private education also closes the door to experimentation, uh, which we would want to have in the public system, but even more added to or reinforced by this private alternative. That's the dilemma with which we would have to struggle in the decision of whether to suppress or not private education. Now, what happened to John Dewey's program in the United States? So Dewey's program was about cooperative problem solving as the method of education. But it was also about criticism, the criticism of established thought, the criticism of established arrangements. And therefore, in a very American idiom, it represented this impulse to transcendence that I referred to earlier. What on the whole the Americans did with Dewey pro program was to accept the first part in this top tier of their educational system, but to reject the second part, the part about criticism. And what they seem to have put in its place is the formation of a particular kind of sociability. So the, the, children, the young are drawn into this cooperative, analytically oriented problem solving, the first part of Dewey's program. But then uh, they're induced to acquire a particular kind of sociability, uh, which I could describe in the following way. They're, they're taught to cast a halo, a radiance of self-effacing, self-depreciating charisma over their fellows. That's a magnetic attraction which should be exercised but at the same time concealed in order to be more effective. And this is what stands behind the approved form of sociability in the, in the society, which you could describe as a cheerful, impersonal friendliness, a kind of middle distance. Uh, uh, in which the members of the professional and business class are supposed to have this form of sociability, of being able to exercise this magnetic attraction while also denying it or concealing it. Uh, that seems to be the real object of the secondary object of education in the top tier in the school system, in which the critical part of Dewey's program is replaced by another form of worldliness. And the private schools, the, the top high schools in the country, its most its famous schools, are involved in the creation of those kinds of, quote, leaders uh, who are uh, magnetic but not, not subversive. Uh, they show the way to their colleagues, but they're not troublemakers or disruptors and so forth. Uh, and of course, this is a perversion. It's a perversion of the program that I'm defending here, but it was already a perversion of Dewey's program. Now, maybe I should stop there and ask again for your commentary. So on, on the third element then, 
there's the assessment, redistribution, and correction. So the correction in a federation would have to take the form of the creation of joint bodies, transfederal cooperation, horizontal among the municipalities and among the states, but also and above all for this case, vertical. That is, the three instances of the federation collaborate in joint bodies. And these bodies then have the power under certain circumstances to take over a local failing school system to attribute its management and reform to independent pedagogic experts, uh, to reconstruct it, to reshape it, and then to return it fixed to the local authorities. So in these societies, the standards of investment and quality have to be national, but the management of the schools have to be local. Because how are you in a country that is very large, very unequal, and federal and structure going to centralize it as it is centralized in a relatively small unitary European state like France, for example? So it's famously said that the French Minister of Education can look at his clock at any particular time of the day at his watch and know exactly what page of Descartes every student in France is studying at that particular time. So this is a, uh, a military exercise, an authoritarian exercise, uh, inimical to experimentalism. Uh, and to the methods that I will next describe, and in any event entirely impractical in countries like the United States or Brazil. So the three instruments that I mentioned are alternatives, alternative ways of reconciling national standards of investment and quality with local management of the schools. Yes? So I, there's part of what you said that I'm struggling to grasp, where if education is to truly be transformed, I don't understand how- Education is what? To be transformed. Yes. I don't understand how public and private can coexist in the form we see today. Would not the existence of private education just continue to reinforce that divide between vanguard and rearguard, and that the university system also participates in that sort of elitist ladder, including perhaps the institution that sure. we all sit. Well, but that's the dilemma, right, that I described. So you but say you, you, you close the escape valve, so you force the, the asset holding class, the elites, to participate in the public system and to agitate for its reformation. That's the argument for not allowing it. But the argument to allow it is to have an additional powerful inducement to experimentation and, and to excellence. Why could we not induce that experimentation in the public system? You can, and to some extent you do. That's the movement in the United States of charter schools mm -hmm. and so forth. But I think you would have to say that uh, the result is modest compared to what you see in the best private schools in the United States, and you compare them to the mass of public schools, there's a huge gap in educational quality. And so the question is, what should be your attitude to that gap? So this is the question of educational elitism in a class society. So the elitism is corrupted or perverted invariably, inevitably, if it takes place against this background of social inequality. But it has a value which is independent of the class structure of society. That's the complication. Let me give you another example, which is an extreme example, especially for an American. But it, it just emphasizes uh, the theme of educational elitism. 
So you know, the American universities were not formed on the British model. They were formed on the German model of the, of the German universities. The German research universities began to be created in the 19th century. Uh, and the, a crucial figure was Wilhelm von Humboldt, who was the Prussian Minister of Education. Uh, so von Humboldt started the University of Berlin, uh, and he established the following rule, that for the first three years of their university education, students would not be tested. There would be no examinations whatsoever. Uh, and then he gave the following public justification uh, of this policy. And a justification which, of course, would be unacceptable in any democracy today. He said, under this system, which I have designed, the vast majority of students will, lose, will waste their time. They're not examined. They won't study. They won't do their work. But the tiny minority of geniuses will be liberated. And as the destiny of the nation rests squarely on the shoulders of the geniuses, we have to sacrifice the interests of the majority to the interests of this minority. And so that's the extreme form of elitism, which we can't accept in that form. But some element of it has, continues to have force anywhere. So. Uh, extreme talent has to be, be able to be expressed and to be liberated. And if there's a space in which we can create alternatives of excellence, the question is whether we should suppress it just because it results in this inequality. So the inequality, as the, the German example shows, is not just a class inequality. There's also the inequality of human talents which are part of the, of the natural fate of humanity. Uh, and uh, Goethe remarked, uh, the only uh, salvation that we have against the superior talents of another person is to love him. Now, <laughs> and this, uh, and I'm not saying that this is, this is the solution that we could have institutionally, but uh, it, it's another way of stating the problem of the inequality of talents and the need for a space in, in which those talents can be expressed. Yes? I, I'm wondering how you approach measuring or knowing when a school district is failing. Like when, when, what, what is the threshold? What does that look like? Is it just is that exams or is it broader than that? Yes, if, well, because then I'm next going to describe a, 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 another pedagogic paradigm. So what I'm saying, so of course what's implied in that idea is they're not failing in the same sense in which the Finns today might consider it failing. That is, they fail because the lower quintile of each class does less well at the international PISA test. That's not the meaning I'm giving. I'm supposing another model of teaching and learning, and then I'm saying failing at that model. So what they're failing at, of course, depends on what our idea of the, the, the style of education should be. And there will always be, and we would certainly want in any educational system that there would be uh, a range of excellences, of forms of excellence recognized so that there would not just be one hierarchical ladder, but a, a plurality of them. But there's still going to be ladders. And one of the things that we most desire in the experience of education is obsession. That is, there has to be passion, pa passion, passionate engagement in a particular thing. Uh, this, is, this is one of the ways in which we describe passion. So it's. It, uh, uh, achievement, by contrast to mediocrity, that is, the individual provoked to be passionate or obsessional about one particular thing. Uh, and then 
one of the ways in which we would describe failure is failure to produce such obsession. Uh, and then, of course, we can debate about the ways in which to recognize and evaluate it and so forth. But there's a change in the conception of the excellence, as your question suggests. Now we come, to, yes. So uh, your, your third point about um, corrective intervention, to me, really seems to mirror what the United States tried uh, under the Bush administration, No Child Left Behind. Mm -hmm. uh, and most uh, people in the public education sector, I really think in American society in general, have regarded that approach as a failure. Certainly, really anyone in public education regards No Child Left Behind as a, as a failed experiment, uh, especially with regard to the systemic takeover of public schools. Uh -huh. uh, and so I'm curious how... But was, was there, in fact, such a localized system of turnaround, as I described? Because w what, I'm su yes. Yes. what I'm supposing is that there's a mechanism which involves cooperation within the federal system, uh, including vertical cooperation between the federal government and local government. Uh, and that then the school system is taken over. In judicial terms, we would say the judge then, if it's a judicial proceeding rather than an administrative proceeding, the judge delegates the administration of the school to a special master, and the special master in turn hires experts who fix it. So it's analogous in some ways uh, under American law to a turnaround under a Chapter 11 bankruptcy of a failing business, when you think it can be saved rather than just abandoned to bankruptcy. Now, would you say that the system tried out in the United States was a variant of that system? Yes, especially uh -huh. with the notion of a turnaround school. That this uh -huh. was precisely what No Child Left Behind sought to implement. Um, so, and where was the failure? The failure was the failure of what? Uh, well, that basically that this didn't uh, tend to fix the schools, um, that these experts uh, were, uh, were mainly education consultants that uh, were not able to implement ways of um, improving the school, or if they were able to improve the school, it was at the expense of a lot of lower achieving students. Um, you know, in schools that I've taught at, um, you know, a lot of these turnaround schools find ways to get rid of. Uh, the schools, uh, the students rather are either lowest performing or biggest discipline issues or highest special needs. Mm -hmm. um, and or uh, in other cases, uh, you have these establishments. But was schools. the problem with the, with the idea of turnaround itself or was the problem with the particular way in which they tried to turn things around? The latter, but I, I think a lot of what you're describing kind of mirrors how that played out. So I think this, of course, this raises a systemic problem about every aspect of the project I'm going to describe. And the, the problem is that it's one thing to have a project, like Dewey's project, for example. And it's another thing to deal with how any project like that is going to be tortured by mediocrity in the reality of the society, right? Because Dewey announces a program but someone else is going to have to teach it. Huh? And uh, so there's going to be this huge gap between the conception of the program and its enactment. So I don't think that that kind of problem can be solved adequately by simply appealing to a special class of technicians, like these educational consultants that you refer. There has to be a movement in society. There have to be hundreds or thousands of teachers in schools throughout the country who are involved in this pedagogic reformation. And then the turnaround draws on them. Uh, and that's a, a different situation socially. And that's the only way in which we could be made real. That's why I mentioned before this idea of these pedagogic programs being national programs. They're not just sort of technocratic fixes of some discrete problem. They're the idea that this is a, a fundamental problem in, the, in our society, and it's w one of the ways in which we need to be liberated. Uh, and then there's a movement. Huh? 
as I say, it's, it, it lives in, it doesn't live in the mind of, the, of a, a set of educational despots. And the technocrats whom they want to use as their instruments, in this case the consultants, it, 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 it draws, it drinks from that movement. That's what's necessary. That doesn't work. Yes. I guess just building on that a little bit, my understanding of one of the failures of that act was that teachers' salary increases were based on the performance of their students on the standardized tests. Uh -huh. And so there was this. So that's another form of this, perversion, right? This whole business of standardized tests. And then, yeah, so I guess how do you do evaluation to indicate failure without falling prey to this? phenomena that unfolded where teachers were either making up scores in order to increase salary or simply teaching And they were teaching to, to the test, to the test right? as opposed to love of learning or yes. educational yes. things, et cetera. Yes, so I think what's, what the, the, the two things that are vital in this are the contours of the pedagogic program. What's the conception of teaching and learning? And then uh, the nature of this movement, huh? which is the real bearer of such a project. It can't live in the, in, a, in the mind of the ideologist, then assisted by the technocratic experts. It has to be a movement that catches on, that lives in society to be feasible. Otherwise, it's, it's going to be the object of all of these perversions. How do you achieve that? Well, that's, you could say that's the problem of every aspect of such a program, right? Uh, but you, you, it's in, in which you have to combine great ambition with the ability to deliver these down payments on the project. That is, this is the method of the, of the always of the political profit. The political prophet has to envision a different future, but at the same time, he has to be able to anticipate it and to give it some tangible expression right now. That's why I'm calling the down payment. And that would, we'd certainly have that problem in spades in a, in a project like this one. Now then, we come to the question of the method of teaching and learning, the pedagogic model of such a project. And the pedagogic model draws on the conception of the mind, and particularly of the imagination. So I now want to return to remarks about the imagination, because the idea of the imagination is the idea on which much in such a pedagogic program draws. So. The mind has two sides. In one side, the mind is like a machine. It is modular and formulaic. But on the other side, the mind is an anti-machine. It's not modular. It's not formulaic. Different, it doesn't have different parts that have unique functions. It enjoys the power of recursive infinity, the power to combine everything with everything else. And it has the power of, that the poet called negative capability, uh, of seeing something, discovering something that does not yet make sense, given the established methods and uh, the existing criteria of sense. And then it retrospectively develops the methods and the ideas that make sense of what it has discovered. So viewed from another angle, there are two moves in the idea of the imagination. One move was the move that Kant emphasized, removal from the phenomenon. We have to go away from the phenomenon. And an image, after all, is the memory of a perception. It's not the perception itself. That's the first move of the imagination. But the second move is the decisive move, 
It's the subsumption of the actual under a range of transformative opportunities in the domain of the adjacent possible, what can happen next. To understand any phenomenon is to grasp what it can become, the next steps, what it can turn into given certain provocations. That's how we understand things in both nature and in social life. And so the focus of education then is the development of these imaginative capabilities of insight, which we deepen our insight into the actual by expanding our imagination of the adjacent possible. Now, having stated briefly that conception of the imagination, let me say one more thing before I go on to the elements of the program. Uh, Nothing in the physical constitution of the brain determines the relative power of these two sides of the mind. So we know that the brain has the attribute of plasticity. When it suffers insults, different parts of the physical structure of the brain can take over other functions. That's what we call plasticity. And plasticity could be seen as an enabling factor in the strengthening of these imaginative capabilities. But nothing in the physical constitution of the brain, not even its, pla not e not even its plasticity, accounts for the relative power of these two sides of the mind. The relative power of the two sides of the mind is shaped primarily by the organization of society and of culture. And that is the reason why we can say that the history of politics is internal to the history of the mind. Now, that's the conception from which I'm proceeding in the outlining of this pedagogic paradigm, this model of teaching and learning that I discuss next. So the first feature is that the emphasis has to be on our capabilities of insight driven by imagination into natural and social life. The, emph the emphasis is cultivating this ability to understand or to imagine transformation. If we don't imagine the transformation <coughs> of a phenomenon, we just stare at it. And then insight degenerates into a retrospective rationalization. The only way in which we develop insight is to develop it through the imagination of transformative possibility. Not the ultimate possibilities, but what can happen next. So it's nothing about the spectral idea of possibility. The spectral idea of possibility is that there's a fixed circumference of possible states of affairs that are like ghosts stalking the world and then they wait for their cues to come onto the stage of actuality. That's not the sense of possibility that I'm invoking. The possible is what we can transform the existing phenomenon into, either through our action or through something that happens to it. Uh, and this, this is the, what's relevant to this educational program this proximate sense of possibility, which subverts or inverts the spectral idea of possibility. So the spectral idea of possibility is like looking at reality through a rear view mirror. So our idea of the possible is shaped by the success of novelties in the world, the making of the new. We look back, and it's manifest in this canonical idea of possibility. It's a different <laughs> idea. It's the, it's the shadow of our power to transform or to observe transformation in nature. That's the idea of possibility. So then the first element in this model of teaching and learning is the cultivation of the analytic and synthetic powers that we need in order to develop insight based on the possible. 
So we robbed from the world, from the phenomenon, some of its brute facticity, its just thereness. And we imagine the existence as a variation on a set of surrounding possibilities. That's how we deepen our insight. And everything in the life of the mind that contributes to this power is then what is essential. So that's not the mastery of dead information of the encyclopedia. It's the development of a certain power, this power which I'm attributing to the imagination. Now, we don't acquire these, and now we come to the second element. The second element is we acquire these powers always in dealing with content. We don't acquire it in a vacuum of content. We deal with particular things, to be sure. But the ambition is not encyclopedic. It's not the memorization of the encyclopedia. We, what we prefer with respect to content is selective depth to encyclopedic superficiality. So it's not the encyclopedic scope. It's not a superficial encyclopedic orientation that we prefer. It's an education that is oriented around themes or projects and therefore proceeds through this selective acquisition or development of the capabilities dealing with topics at depth. Now, the third attribute of this model of education is the attribute that in the history of education is described under the label of classical education in both the Western and the Eastern societies. So, what was a classical education? A classical education was an education not just in the contemporary disciplines, but also in another civilization that had a genealogical relation to the present, but was at the same time removed from the present. And that in the West was Greco-Roman antiquity the study of the Greek and Roman classics. In China, it was the study of the Confucianist canon. But the fundamental idea is the idea that there is a double vision. So you're able to see reality with the eyes of today, but also with the eyes of another civilization that nevertheless had some affinity with the present, because it was, in, the, in both the Chinese and the Western instances, the historical basis of the present. Now, what is the problem with this idea of classical education? The problem is its dogmatic and canonical character. Why just that canon? So there would have to be the multiplication of canons. So the mind has to have access to some form of experience, a vision, to ideas that are not just the vision and ideas of the present. It has to be able to look at them with the eyes of another part of humanity, far removed in space or in time, uh, and that's part of this idea of education, this duality of vision, in which we reinvent the notion of classical education through the multiplication of canons. You say there's not one canon, there are many possible canons, and we can cultivate this duality of vision through the study of any of those other canons. Now then, the fourth attribute of this model of teaching and learning is that it be cooperative. And cooperation is intimately related to the development of the imagination. So we see this, for example, in the evolution of technology. What is technology? Technology is a, way, a materialization of the channel between our experiments in the mobilization of natural forces, like electricity, and our experiments in the organization of cooperation, of cooperative regimes, uh, the technical division of labor. And technology is just the material form 
of that combination of experiments about nature and about ourselves. Uh, and cooperation is the method of advanced science, and cooperation is the alternative to what characterizes conventional education, which is the juxtaposition of authoritarianism and individualism. So cooperation among students, among teachers, among schools. They, they teach both in presence and at a distance. They teach together. They experiment together. Cooper cooperation is the indispensable social background to this cooperative problem solving focused on the imagination. And the fifth attribute of this model of teaching and learning is the most difficult to enact. And that is that it be dialectical. So the principle is no subject, no discipline should be studied only once, none. Everything should be studied at least twice from contrasting points of view. And what makes this possible as a matter of the allocation of time is the abandonment of the encyclopedic ideal. So we don't have the notion that there has to be a particular scope with respect to contents. We can be selective. Because we can be selective, we can be also deep and we can be dialectical. So. The idea that you would study physics, for example, just by an anti-historical method, because that's the way that it predominates in contemporary quantum mechanics and relativity theory, is unacceptable, even in the study of early physics. We know now that the universe has a history. We discovered that in the 1920s. And if the universe has a history, then every part of nature is historical. And we must have a way of studying it which makes history superior to structure rather than structure superior to history. It inverts the logic. So those are the essential attributes of the model of education that I'm describing. And they do have a, an affinity to, uh, to other ideas about education. They're sometimes labor progressive including John Dewey's program, but they go, I think they go much further uh, in, a, in a particular direction. And uh, they have a prophetic character, and they then respond or resonate with the theme that under democracy, under a high energy democracy, there is a we recognize a diffusion of prophetic powers in the whole of humanity. So the theme of the Protestant Re Reformation was the priesthood of all believers. There are no priestly, privileged priestly intermediaries <coughs> between God and the believer. And now we have the theme that follows on that, which is the prophetic power of every human being. The school under democracy approaches the young student as a tongue-tied prophet and attempts to equip him with the instruments with which to exercise his prophetic powers. That's the, the larger ambition of this program. Now, I've described it in a form in which it is an ideal of general education. And in Europe, in the European societies especially, general education was the education of elites. And technical education, vocational training, was the education of the masses. Uh, and technical education, under the old German model, was education in the conventional trades and in machine-specific and job-specific skills, like how to use the five kinds of metal-cutting lathes that are required 
by conventional industry. And now we need a different idea of technical education. So under this different idea, the emphasis in technical education falls on the higher order flexible practical and conceptual capabilities required by the, for the use of numerically controlled machine tools, the technologies of the knowledge economy. So these are machines that can be reprogrammed constantly as they are used. They don't have a dedicated use. Uh, we, a dramatic example of this is 3D printing, so-called additive manufacturing. We have a conception. We materialize the conception. We give it a material form. And we adjust constantly the machine according to our transformation of the conception. So we're able to go back and forth between the, the abstraction, the conception, and the materialization of the conception. And by going back and forth, of course, other ideas or conjectures occur to us about variations which we could not discover if they had not been materialized. So once we reconceive technical or vocational training in that way, it's no longer starkly opposed to general education. It's on a spectrum. It's on a continuum with this transformed idea of general education. It's part of the same idea which we can then give a technical or a general expression to. So that's the basic idea about education. And in relation to your question about failure, it's success or failure at that, at, at that model. Now, uh, I return to, to the earlier theme in our conversation. This is only feasible in any form if it lives as a national movement. It's not feasible as the project of an educational despot or a narrow cadre of technocratic problem solvers, fixers. It has to be the expression of a movement. The movement has to be sustained by hundreds, thousands of teachers in schools throughout the society, and it has to be the object of a national debate. Uh, otherwise, it can't live in the form in which I've described it. It becomes a fantasy, like Plato's fantasy about kidnapping the children from their, from their families. Uh, but in this larger form, then, it becomes intimately related to the ambitions of the political and economic projects that I described earlier in the course. So let me stop and again ask for your comments and questions. Yes. Um, I think you answered it when you were trying to describe the spectrum between general education and technical, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. I think there was some pushback lately where countries are trying to make everybody into an entrepreneur. And uh, pushback, I think, is coming from I suppose civil society activists and experts who are saying not everybody can take on that kind of responsibility that you are imposing on them. Yes. There is some case to be made about Fordism. I mean, certain section which can retain educational Fordism, whereas the whereas some can actually bubble up to the surface as entrepreneurs. So I, I think there's clearly a tension there. And uh, I'm not sure what the best way is to to create that spectrum. But why do you think it's like the problem of making everyone an entrepreneur? So the idea of making everyone an entrepreneur, I can understand why it would occur in the present societies. Because, because of this reality that I described, of the subjective petty bourgeoisie. That is, the, ma the mass of people in these societies is poor, relatively, if not absolutely, and has this petty bourgeois horizon of aspiration. And therefore, it's natural to think that in some sense they desire to be entrepreneurs. Uh, so 
But of course, it would be an exaggeration to say everyone becomes like that. But that's, that's the practical justification. There's another, there's another source, which is those, because there's another source, which is those trying to, uh, uh, those establishing startups in the knowledge economy, because the industrial production has, has But that's a tiny elite, right? It is an elite, but the influence of that phenomena then has an influence on the education system, on what kind of, how do we need to prepare? Well, everyone who is an Uber driver or who's delivering uh, orders on a, on a motorcycle is a solo entrepreneur. Uh, and that doesn't require any high-tech startups, but it, it, it is part of the situation of the subjective petty bourgeoisie becoming the majority uh, and of precarious labor. Uh, uh, disguised form of, of employment. So that seems to me to refer to another problem. I'm trying to understand why you were thinking of this in the educational context. So the real problem in the educational context is this. This project that I've described, this agenda, uh, requires that it be taught by thousands of people, right? So it means the formation of a different repertoire of pedagogic materials. They have to be made available. They're obviously going to be a subject of controversy in the society, all of this. And there's going to be this difficulty, which I described as the torture of, me of, of mediocrity. So one thing is for me to sit here and announce this program. Uh, of liberation. The other thing is what it's going to be look, what it's going to look like when the actual teacher walks into the classroom, uh, given his limitations in all of these societies. So the, the question is whether there can be a momentum of transformation that survives the, that survives the mediocrity. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about the fourth and fifth criteria. Um, at first, when I heard you say that education must be cooperative, it reminded me a lot of what I've heard at the ed school about new ideas about liberatory education, which I think um, a lot of people define as students taking charge of learning, engaging with texts without a lot of context and making meaning themselves and learning that way, which sounds really different from the fifth piece. No, so. it was, I wasn't thinking of that. I wasn't giving it the meaning that you implied. Okay. Well, uh, um, so I, I the, in the history of educational theories and educational reform, there was such a movement in the 19th century. It was called the Lancastrian method. It was a movement that allowed students to teach one another uh, and, it, and the only, and so far as I know, the only country in the world in which it was implemented for some time was Uruguay, which in the 19th century was a kind of Switzerland in South America. Uh, but it was not the object of widespread experimentation. Fair enough. I, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the fifth, the fifth piece where you say that education should be dialectical. dialectical. Yeah. Um, I think um, some of that sounds really interesting and exciting to me, but part of me wonders if that just changes the shape of the box that we're limiting the students' imagination to. It's certainly better than just you know, teaching people one thing and only limiting their reality to one particular orthodoxy, um, but I wonder if that's just a... Well, no, but it's a response to a particular thing. The idea of the dialectical method was a response to the earlier claim in my argument of the, of the nature of the, of the university culture. So the claim is that the national curriculums are a simplification or infantilization of the orthodoxies of the university culture. Now, the orthodoxies of the university culture, according to another claim I made in the argument, are based, among other things, on these forced marriages of method and subject matter. 
and on the concealment of the philosophical presuppositions of the, of the, of the teachings of science. So they're not just hard empirical discoveries. They all depend on the combination of that hard empirical residue with something else. And once we understand this problematic element in science, we look at these things with different eyes. So the, the ambition of the dialectical method was not just a generic allusion to imagination. It was a, the practical question of how in these cultures we are to immunize the young against their susceptibility to these orthodoxies. So I want them to be delivered to the higher stages of education, protected against the servility of the, of, of the university culture. And I therefore want basic education to be more profound than university education. So in other words, we, we change the character of the educational system from the bottom up. We change it by already educating the very young from the outset in methods that make them less susceptible to the indoctrination that they will later receive. That was the particular target of my proposal of the dialectical method. And I would say that in these societies, which are not just class societies, but societies dominated by these intellectual dogmas, uh, this is the only way to liberate the mind, to understand that these subjects can be approached from alternative points of view and that there is a contest, there is a war between these points of view. And that, that's intellectual liberation. That, that was the idea. Yes. on the technical aspect and devolving totally the dialectical and the imaginative aspect. So mm -hmm. uh, making uh, the, having a specific terminological uh, doable just to, for a job or subsistence and survival, but not letting the human progress at the level of the mind or the level of the dialectic. So, and then there was a civil society opposition from various ways and means and thought processes to this. Uh, so before the child is able to again, uh, right from the 8, 9, 10 standard, it, all of this is taken away. And then the a very basic technical aspect, like building a fan or building a shooting yes. machine, to be able for them to be survived. That's yes. And India, of course, has a long tradition of uh, activism and popular self-education, right? Uh, which all of which in, in a real society, these educational reforms would have to draw on, 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 that, on that tradition. I think that this is, it's much more plausible than you can imagine a national movement with this character that I invoked in a society which is attempting to change the character of its economic life and to go from a knowledge economy for the few to a knowledge economy for the many. Because the knowledge economy, in its deepened and disseminated form, requires this higher form of education. Uh, and similarly, too, with the substitution of weak democracies by the higher energy democracies that I described, they too require these capabilities. So I think that this educational movement, which I want, uh, is much more feasible to be created, to be established in a society which is struggling for its self-reformation its self in these other domains. Uh, uh, as an isolated movement for a society that is not changing its character in these ways, it's much less plausible. So that's the causal nexus that goes from politics and economics to education. On the other hand, 
the transformation of education would exercise causal influence on politics and the, econ and the, and the economy because it would create individuals who were impatient, restless, uh, imaginative in, in, to, to a higher extent. Yes? Right, so you emphasize the importance of this uh, being uh, a national movement, that it needs widespread endorsement for this to work. And I'm wondering how that squares with, I mean, an idea that might well be wrong, that there's a certain kind of like a privacy right that parents have over the, I mean, the, the, the character and the content of the education of their children. Um, this is, I think, especially strong in the United States, but I wonder how much your proposal involves a rejection of that idea. Uh, it does resolve, involve, it does imply the rejection of any extreme form of that <laughs> idea, right? I mean, I said at the beginning, uh, the, family ha the, family w the family can't be removed, contrary to Plato, but the family has to be resisted because what is the interest of the family? The interest of the family is to create, ordinarily, someone in, in its own model. Uh, uh, so the, the ideology of the family is the ideology of the amoeba. Uh, today, self-replication, tomorrow, the world. Uh, and that's what has to be resisted given this conception of democracy and transcendence. Yes? Yeah, so um, I grew up in an academic system where there was a lot of, kind of students teaching each other, like you referenced. Um, the Lancastrian method yeah. in some form. And yeah. um, there's definitely a lot of merit to that method. Uh, but I think, in my experience, it was often a substitute for an just inadequate amount of teachers as well. Yes, I didn't propose the Lancastrian method myself. Huh? I, I can see its attractions. I propose cooperation among students, among teachers, and among schools. Uh, I didn't propose that the young would teach the young. Uh, I can see a reason to experiment with that, like many other things, but I would never regard it as a, as, as, as a mainstay. Yeah. Um, completely understand that. I also was kind of curious, though, it still kind of alludes to a problem that does exist. There just are not enough teachers, and the classrooms are in settings where there's 30 plus students to one teacher. Mm -hmm. I was curious how you might try to resolve that problem. Um, in kind of re resolve school. which problem? The problem of... Of teacher, of there being teachers? There being far too few teachers. For far too few, and far too few who are able to teach in this way that I described, right? So then... The, this is the attractive part of what the Finns have achieved, to make the teaching profession attractive, rewarding, uh, so that more talented young people go into teaching, uh, so it becomes uh, plausible as a, uh, as a career uh, for, for the young. Uh -huh. But then there's the whole problem of how we train these teachers, how we educate them. Uh, and uh, and there, too, they're, they're very intractable dilemmas. So do we educate them in education schools? That is, is, is the education of the teachers removed from the teaching of the disciplines, or do we educate them uh, in, in the disciplines themselves. Because in the education schools, are, it's, they're likely to be captured by, by fads, by fashions in the intelligentsia, uh, and then not exposed to the fighting issues within the disciplines. Uh, so that would be relevant, especially for secondary education, for high schools. Uh, on the other hand, there are uh, intractable problems. So, for example, in the teaching of mathematics. Uh, in China, there are widespread experiments in the use of advanced number and set theory early on in the education of the young. Uh, 
So then arithmetic is studied already in the light of set theory and number theory. You start very high, very high up the ladder of abstraction. And it seems to me to just to be an empirical issue. To what extent this is feasible, to what extent it can succeed, uh, is something we don't know, or we don't know enough about. Is it good only for those who are exceptionally gifted, or can it appeal and be useful for a much larger part of humanity? So I think this is actually a moment where I could say, if you, I, I hadn't intended to speak about this, but I'll say it. I spoke about it in another place on another occasion, uh, which is your education of all of you. Uh, and I'll say a word about that, what I think about that. So the more advanced you are in your education, uh, the more education is inevitably self-education. Not education in school. Huh? And uh, so the university is good at some things and bad at other things. The university is good at teaching skills deployed in particular disciplinary settings. How to solve problems in mathematical physics. How to read and translate German and so forth. That's the kind of thing that the university is good at. What the university is surprisingly bad at is thought. Uh, so uh, the, the actual experience of thinking uh, and thinking beyond the boundaries in particular disciplines is not what the university is good at. And the most common defect in the education of educated people is an inadequate acquaintance with the history of philosophy. Because the history of philosophy is the source of the most basic ideas in our civilization. Now, there is a remedy for this, which everyone can enact in his own experience. The first thing you should do is study the history of philosophy. And what I especially recommend to you, for in English, is Frederick Copplestone, C-O-P-L-E-S-T-O-N, History of Philosophy in 12 volumes in paperback, readily available. It has an immense advantage over other histories of philosophy in English or in the West. It's not opinionated. Frederick Copplestone was an aristocratic English priest, a Jesuit, uh, and he displays remarkable self-restraint in the, his history of philosophy. Is written between 1950 and 1975, and it states the doctrines of the philosophers. So now the professors, the professoriate in general, uh, looks down on so-called secondary works. It's a stupid form of intellectual snobbery, uh, which makes no sense at all. That you. you, you a, 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 de a detailed acquaintance with the doctrines of philosophers is immensely valuable. In any study, in any discipline, like this study that we're having in political economy. Now, what I suggest is that you combine that by electing a thinker and studying everything he ever wrote. So then you form your mind in dialogue with a particular thinker and not necessarily a thinker with whom you feel affinity. It could be a thinker who represents the opposite of what you think, but you have to be guided by intuition. And this is a program which you could implement, at least the first part of the program, the study of the history of philosophy, in a single summer. So there's no reason not to do it. Uh, and you, you get into a rocket, a missile, and you escape the gravitational field of the present ideas and fashions and the tendencies and the disciplines in which you have formed yourself. And that's a large part of what education has to be. So this educational program that I described is for the early stages of education, for the education of the very young. 
But at the higher stages, the school is accessory. If you can find in the course of your education one, one or two people who can inspire you, you should judge yourself extraordinarily lucky because that doesn't always happen. Uh, the school is to acquire these capabilities in particular disciplines, but at the, in, at the center, at the core of your education, only you can educate yourself. Uh, and so it's, a, it's an isolated activity. And I don't want all this discourse about a narrative of national liberation to suggest to you that it's anything different from that. In the end, you have to save yourself intellectually, as in every other domain. Uh, so those are my suggestions. Uh, now, uh, comments, questions? about my suggestion or about the educational program that I just uh, explored in the course of this class. Globalization will remain for next week. Uh, it's a momentous subject. It deserves a class of its own. All right, well, we can be next week.
speaking they will be there yeah. but yeah. the thing is to just to organize and you know mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean it's you know especially if you have administration background they're usually willing to help too mm -hmm. I don't know if that would be through HLS or HKS but yeah uh, I mean I, I guess uh, uh, if I have 15 courses from my campus mm -hmm. then Essentially, because it's just on the Harvard space altogether, but it's mostly in HKS. I have to kind of figure out on that part. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether, whether it necessarily has to be in HKS. If it necessarily has to be in HKS, then then fine, then we put it. But my idea was to you know have it in HKS. But mm -hmm. if that's the case, then you guys can do that. Yeah, I mean Yeah, I think so. 